Last week, I posted a video about chalcedony and what it tells us about the likelihood that a great flood some 4,400 years ago covered the continents in the sedimentary rocks that we see today. If you haven't seen that video and want to watch it, you'll find a link to it in the info bar below. In that earlier video, I sketched the formation of Chalcedony in general terms, indicating that evidence from the banding in much of the agate and chert points to a very slow accumulation of silica over time, carried by hydrothermal fluids in the upper crust, usually while the region is underwater. Today, I want to talk about some rocks that I've been collecting and studying for the past half dozen years. Part of my motivation for doing that is that in the case of these rocks, it's possible to trace the history of their formation from the clues provided by their very nature. These rocks, called Boley agates, are found in a formation in east-central Oklahoma, trending north-south for about 50 miles, cut by both forks of the Canadian River and perhaps 10 miles wide. The formation is a conglomerate rich in quartz sand and hematite cement, and the rocks of interest are rounded pebbles and cobbles that are weathering out of that conglomerate. As you can see from these photos, these specimens consist of chert clasts that have been cemented by silica, which often exhibits the banding and translucence that I talked about in my earlier video, and that justifies the identification of these rocks as a type of agate. In many cases, it's obvious that the chert has been broken in situ and that the breaks have later been repaired by the invading silica. In those cases, you can easily enough fit the pieces back together without having to move them very far. It's easy enough to reconstruct a general timeline for the formation of these agates, and I'm going to do it here in six steps. Step one is the formation of the chert itself. That is a process that takes an enormous amount of time, because unlike such sedimentary rocks as sandstone and shale, chert forming silica isn't simply dumped into a basin and left to lithify, nor can it be precipitated directly from seawater like some limestones. It has to be deposited by hydrothermal fluids deep within the Earth's crust. Step two is associated with tectonic forces. The chert, having formed at depth, is fractured in situ. This is often associated with the process of mountain building, which begins when continents approach each other and the sedimentary rock between them begins to buckle and fold. The compressive forces raise the temperature of the crust and hydrothermal fluids course through the cracks, depositing silica in the voids and repairing the breaks. Step three is the tectonic uplift of the region above sea level. Deposition ceases and erosion begins. Eventually, weathering and erosion expose the brecciated chert, which itself experiences mechanical weathering and falls into stream beds. In step four, clasts of this chert brescia, here and after known as Boley agate, are rounded by stream transport and eventually deposited in a nearshore basin. Step five is the cementation of the contents of that basin into the iron-rich conglomerate that I described earlier. The Boley conglomerate is made up of the kinds of materials that one finds at the mouths of streams, sand, pebbles, and cobbles. In the final step, the region experiences further uplift and the overburden is removed from the conglomerate by weathering and erosion. Agates and other pebbles weather out of the conglomerate and some of them are collected by yours truly. As you can see, the chert clasts that are the primary constituents of these agates exhibit a very wide range of colors and hues, as does the silica cement itself. This is indicative of changes in subsurface water chemistry over time, which is in turn affected by changes of oceanic, atmospheric, and soil chemistry in the region. And when I say over time, I'm not talking about a few thousand years. 
The six steps that I outlined earlier take many millions of years. The wonderful thing about these rocks is that anyone can retrace the steps by which they came to be. When you look at these rocks, you're basically looking at those six steps. So let me retrace them briefly. First, the chert has to form. Second, it has to be fractured and repaired in situ, creating what's known as a chert brescia. Third, the region has to be raised above sea level so that the brecciated chert can be exposed at the surface, be broken by mechanical weathering, and fall into stream beds. Fourth, those streams begin transporting those chert clasts toward the sea, constantly smoothing over their rough edges and rounding them into the form in which we find them today. Fifth, those rounded pebbles and cobbles of what I'm now calling Boley Agate have to be deposited into a near-shore depositional basin where they are cemented into a conglomerate. Sixth and finally, further uplift of the region raises that basin above sea level. The overburden is weathered and eroded away, exposing the Boley conglomerate, and agates begin to weather out of that conglomerate. Each of those steps requires vast stretches of time. You can reconstruct the whole process for yourself, letting Hutton's uniformitarian principle guide your thinking. And once you've done it, you can't help but realize that no other explanation will do nearly as well. Here is a photo of the site from which the agates were taken. Here's some petrified wood that I found at the same site. And here are a few more bowly agates from the same site. The Earth isn't 6,000 years old, boys and girls. It's much, much older than that. Older by many orders of magnitude. And that's what makes it interesting. Thank you.